So I'm here with Derek Mahoney. Derek Mahoney is a, I'd say, Derek, you're one of the most famous non-mainstream orthodontists in Australia. Yeah, now you did your training in the UK, so Correct. you are a qualified orthodontist. That's right. And you have had a lot of flack because not only are you non-mainstream, you're not just following the, the traditional method of orthodontics, but you're teaching it. And you're teaching it to non-orthodontists, to dentists. So it's given you, I think you've had slightly undue flack for that. Well, I always learnt from what Robert Ricketts taught me and he said I don't care if the cleaner wants to come to my lecture if he learns something that helps the general public at large why not and I've always held the view that um, I was lucky to do a postgraduate education but that doesn't mean that we as a profession are the font of all knowledge and I have very good general dentists who do amazing orthodontics mm. and um, in a country like Australia with a huge population spread over a vast area not everyone can get to a specialist orthodontist yeah um, so I really am passionate in that um, everyone who wants to learn has a right to learn yeah I think you know that one of my themes that I've addressed constantly is we're coming into this area where almost not people a lot of people consider knowledge to be free now, I mean, a lot of kids don't, aren't happy to pay for music, even which we considered a standard. Yeah, kids now don't want to pay for music. We're going this era where a lot of people consider knowledge to be free. Yeah, and this is conflicting slightly with uh, the old instinct of this is mine. Yeah, if you want to hear it, you're going to have to pay for it. And groups of people wanting to set up walls such as qualifications so that other people can't get into this. And I'm kind of a little, I'm anti this, and I know you are as well. Well, I think you're talking in general terms about what we would call the old boys club, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, without question, it's the old boys club. And I think both of us stand against just, you know, just having freedom, just, you know, it's, it's choice and what people, you know, learning it should be for everyone. Yes. Um, Cool. Now, I was very impressed with the, the, the recent work you've been doing and some of the statistics you were giving today. It was, it was amazing me. It was. Do you want to, do you want to cover, vaguely cover a little bit of this? Yeah. So over the last 15 years, I've been collecting data on patients referred to me for orthodontic care. We limited our uh, research protocols to children between age seven and nine who had been referred in purely for treatment of a malocclusion by... Uh, a dentist, uh, by a medical doctor, by an enos and throat doctor, by word of mouth, whatever way they came to the practice. Yeah. But one thing I did differently um, is I asked all these patients to have a sleep study. Um, and I looked at the correlation between those who had a malocclusion and those who had what's called sleep disorder breathing problems. And I thought, you know, based on previous research I've read, which they really only gave a patient a... Um, a sleep questionnaire uh, rather than an actual sleep study and they showed sort of 17% to maybe 30% of children who had a malocclusion had um, sleep disorder breathing problems. In our data, which is a huge sample, um, we were showing 92%. Mm -hmm. And that's because we measured not just the apneic events or the hypopneic events, we also measured uh, the resistance, so the RDI. Mm. Uh, and that picked up a lot of kids who may not have apnea in the way it's defined, but certainly had problems breathing because they had nasal problems, uh, well, etc. clearly, with my, my, always my concern with sleep apnea, it, it's a constructed definition. Correct. So many of these, so many of those times by that, add on one of those and yeah. we've got yeah. our product. And that doesn't fit everyone. Absolutely. And even uh, Christian Gumner, who you know, is the father of sleep medicine mm. and who developed this AHI, um, he says, don't treat to the numbers, you know, look at the individual. And he's very passionate at Stanford in looking at um, the muscles and the, and the posture of the tongue as methods to help um, uh, limit collapse of the airway at night. Mm. Mm. No, 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 I've met him several times. Um, and where do you see yourself going now with this? Where, where, where's, where's the goal with this PhD? You know, what's, you know, you, you clearly got a passion about this. And I think that breathing and breathing issues have added a new dimension to what we've always been talking about. Absolutely. I think I would like our profession, the orthodontics, 
uh, to realize that we're losing our profession to technology. I mean, nowadays patients can make their own aligners, as you well know. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, so, 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 so if a patient views an orthodontist purely as a tooth straightener, I mean, we're, we're, we're not in the marketplace. Every general dentist does uh, Invisalign, mm. um, et cetera, et cetera. But I think where our profession should be going is looking at the correlation between children's sleep and their malocclusion. And as we know, we've debated this many times, and your father has been at the forefront of linking malocclusion to epigenetic problems rather than genetic problems. Mm. And um, oh, environmental. Environmental and, yep. and postural. Yep. And uh, to me, let's add airway to that. Yeah, well, it's, it's an important, you know, um, I've been talking about this concept of trying to link it together with this concept of craniofacial dystrophy. Yes, and saying yes. that it, it, it's, it's a global structural change with the face, and yep. the airway is one of the other symptoms. So we list out the symptoms, many ENT problems, many airway problems, and of course crooked teeth. But we need to come out of this sort of limited viewpoint to see the greater. Yes. I mean, they'll see the whole. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think... When I saw a parent, a CBCT that shows the three-dimensional airway, show them how narrow their child's airway is, and I show a repeat CBCT after I finish my uh, orthopedic correction, and they see not just a better looking face and more room for the teeth, but what they really see is a change in that child's behavior. You know, they're performing better at school, they're sleeping better. And many parents say to me, Dr. Mahoney, thank you, my kids' teeth look amazing, but thank you more so for giving me back a new child. Mm. And I think that's powerful. You know, when you talk to a parent about airway problems and sleep in their children, it's always more, um, they, they, they understand that more than they understand at what age should we straighten our child's teeth. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, no, moving out. And I think that it's, um, you know, important to get this knowledge and information out to people as well, because at the moment it, it, it's, it's a shame that many parents of children with sleep issues have no idea about what we're saying. Exactly, exactly. And I think we as orthodontists are the prime people to pick up things in the mouth that are indicative of sleep disorder breathing, the narrow palate, the crossbite, the bruxism, uh, the large tonsils, you know. Uh, All the other symptoms of craniofacial dystrophy yes. and the underlying problems. So if someone's got these issues, they probably have the other issues. Exactly, exactly. And I think when I graduated from orthodontic school, we looked at just the teeth. And in fact, our job was to get everything into angles, you know, class one, six keys. And what I realized now, you can do that and bring that back here in the face, and that's not good for the child. As, yes, interesting. I w we want to talk to you about your concept of class four malocclusion, but let's right. talk about that separately. <clears throat> um, I think, as far as mine, I know yourself, is now getting this message out there. I mean, you've got to publish this research. I mean, I think by the time we put this out, you will have published this research. And we need to popularize it. We need people to know what you have found because it's another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And it all fits together very, very nicely. And I think one thing that I'd like the orthodontist to pick up from this study is when they take a lateral CEF, if they're even not going to do a CBCT, measure hyoid bone position. Look yeah. at position of maxilla. I think we've got to get away from this SNA being 82 degrees concept, really. Yes. Um, We've got to understand that the position of the maxilla is the most important thing when it comes to the child's airway. And why are all these children that I've been seeing with malocclusions have undeveloped arches and retronathic maxillas, mandibles? It's because of their breathing. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, we see well, it's, that. It's because of this, this change in structural form. Yeah. And it's a global change in structural form. Yeah. We just... <sighs> People almost don't want to believe that their face, whole facial form isn't correct. I, I There's a huge resistance I to agree. this. And I think that when this happens, this psychological change in the mind, well, I, I often say this is of only interest to people who have a face. <laughs> All the people with that faces, they're, they're not interested in this. Yeah, no, no, I'm interested in hearing what we're saying. But it's going to be when they, everyone on the planet clocks the the way their facial form is that that the, who they think they are that image on their passport when they clock that may not be how their full genetic potential correct when people recognize that then i think changes then we will we've gone over the um point of maximum resistance and it will be everyone want they want the people want to hear this yeah and it's in their interest to hear this 
Absolutely. You know, it's 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 health. It's appearance, and I think I wouldn't go for far. You know, as you were talking about education, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and I think it's probably even longevity. Yeah, yeah. You know, I went to a lecture a while ago, and I said that in the states, and I said in my lecture, I thought that ten percent of people in America over the age of sixty years old were going to die ten years early because of sleep apnea and its consequences. Yes, yeah, and that's been the, the well. Do you know the response I got to a T when I was talking? You know, in the, after after meeting, yeah, coffee, yeah. and chatting, everyone said to me, "Mike, I think you're, you're you're being a bit conservative there." Oh right, okay, yeah. You know, and that's now. Now, when you go back to those guys who are now sixty, I don't think malocclusion was as high then. Mm. So, if malocclusion's far worse now, what's his predictor of what's going to happen? And if you link that on what is the cost on the health budget of misdiagnosed and untreated OSA? Well, the sleep apnea goes, it's so permeating. You know, if you, they often say that if you could sell a quality sleep as a pill, it mm-hmm. would be the biggest selling drug on the planet. Absolutely. The quality sleep, not the sort of stuff you can get with sleeping pills. Correct. But, you know, we're talking about, you know, there's a concept where, you know, obesity, you know, do you become, do obese people become sleep apneic? Or if you're sleep apneic, do you crave the types of food that make you obese? Well, there's lots of research to link um, uh, the hormonal changes associated with poor sleep, not getting into stage three uh, non-rapid eye movement, deep sleep. Um, and um, you're right, uh, uh, the, the body's natural uh, appetite suppressant, right, uh, is not released when you have uh, uh, poor, poor mm. sleep. So I think um, it is that scenario, this vicious cycle, where people are not sleeping while they're eating more, and then as they're eating more, their obesity is contributing to their apnea. Mm. I know the latest research would say if you can reduce your BMI by 10%, you can reduce your um, AHI by a third. That's huge. Mm. Yeah, huge. You know? And yet, what's the two things we're seeing more in modern society? More malocclusion, more obesity. More OSA. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, 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 bang. We could, we're not totally certain which is following which. Exactly. No, we, exactly. it's still a grey area, which we need more research. And to yeah. get more research, we need more publicity. And this is not even talking about the relationship with diabetes. Yes. And it's not even talking about the relationship with cor- cor- coronary vascular issues. Absolutely. You know, that, that's leaving those aside. Yeah. And then clearly with the concept with ADH may be leading to sleep apnea. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, ADHD may yep. be related to sleep apnea. Yes. So, you know, this is a huge topic that just needs some examination. Absolutely. And at Absolutely. the moment, it seems all of the different specialities involved in this are sitting on the side and saying, it's just the way it is. Mm. It's mm. just genetic. Well, I, I'd have to disagree with that. Because, <laughs> I, I know you would. <laughs> uh, if it was just genetic, then really we're all, we're all doomed, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. No, no. no. I firmly believe, and I've been doing this for 30 years in my practice, um, that if you can change a kid's airway by arch development, by maxillary protraction, by whatever, you definitely see an improvement in that child's mm. sleep, their performance at school, um, you know, and better looking faces, which which is yeah, yeah, what yeah. we've discussed yeah, so we've years discussed ago. For years. Yeah, no, and I mean, this is with dad's mission for so long. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's another story. But listen, Derek, thank you very much on that.